spend any time at sea, this is something you hope you never have to do. Although it takes this life raft only a few seconds to inflate, if your yacht was sinking beneath you, it would seem like forever. Most people who have to use one of these rafts for real are rescued within days or even hours. They're not designed for long-term situations. Because of that, the supplies on board are pretty limited. There's just a pint of water per person. That's not a lot if you happen to sink in the tropics. But occasionally you do hear extraordinary stories about survival at sea. Dougal Robertson, 38 days adrift with his family. Steve Callahan, 76 days alone in a life raft. And Morris and Marilyn Bailey, 119 days from shipwreck to rescue. To live for that long, we've worked out that each person would need this much food, but this much water. So how do you make up the difference? Well, that's one of the things we'll find out in this programme as we explore survival at sea. Well, the sea can be as hostile, if not more so, than any other environment. Well, you can have it all, can't you? You can have the heat of the desert, the lack of water of the desert, and you can have the freezing cold of the Arctic all in the ocean. But you can find food here quite readily. That's one advantage. I think the key thing is preparation. Most of those people who have survived for long periods at sea have a mentality, a preparation mentality, that is a necessary part of seamanship. Because when you're at sea, you're entering the world's largest wilderness. Anyone spending any time at sea needs specific survival skills. If you have to abandon ship, you have to know what to do. Even the crew of a frigate like this one has been through the Royal Navy's basic sea survival course, learning skills that save lives. During the Second World War, the Royal Navy lost a lot of people in the water. Something like two-thirds of the people that went into the water didn't survive, about 30,000. We learned that we needed to improve our sea survival training. Stand yourself up and roll in. Uh, roll in, don't step in, always roll in. OK. One test at the Institute of Naval Medicine showed how poor equipment was costing lives. They found that an unconscious body tends to turn to face the waves, increasing the chances of inhaling water and drowning. Now all Navy life jackets have a simple hood that could have saved thousands of lives. The Royal Navy trains both its own recruits and civilian sailors how to abandon ships safely, so that if they do end up in the water, they'll know what to expect. Of course, our ships are very unlikely to sink, but by virtue of the fact that they are warships, there is always the, uh, the, the possibility that um, the worst could happen. And we would be remiss if we did not train our people in, in dealing with that situation. One of these will keep you afloat indefinitely. But even if you haven't got a life jacket, you can improvise. In 1995, Zachary Mayo was a US Marine serving on the aircraft carrier USS America. The ship was sailing through the Indian Ocean, where the nights can be hot and stuffy. One night, Zachary had come on deck to get a breath of fresh air when a door like this one swung open and knocked him 30 feet into the sea. When you see a ship pull away from you, it's like you're helpless and you can't do anything about it. It was really lonesome and scary. As the ship kept getting further and further away, I knew that I was going to have to at least hold up until the morning. So you're in the middle of the Indian Ocean with no way of raising the alarm and more crucially, no life jacket. What on earth do you do? I had to kick my boots off. Then I had to take my pants off. 
And what I do is, I have to go underwater like this. I had to tie the legs into knots. Basically just taking them around and tying a regular knot into them. And I'd fill the legs up to air like this. And I'd just float on them. <laughs> Zachary Mayo had to spend two nights like this, never knowing whether he'd be found. It was 30 hours before he was even reported missing. I was scared. I was really scared. I basically prayed for God to watch over me and help me get through this. America launched a search, but to no avail. Luckily, Zachary was found just in time by the crew of a Pakistani fishing boat who pulled him to safety. I don't think I could uh, survive much longer due to the fact that I was sunburned, uh, dehydrated. Uh, my muscles weren't able to move anymore, and I was pretty much done for. Zachary Mayo's stamina was amazing, but he was lucky to fall overboard in the Indian Ocean where the sea temperature is in the high 20s. If you fall into colder water like this, then the muscles in your hands and arms seize up, making crucial survival tasks impossible. We set up a demonstration to show just how quickly that can happen. To show that, we're going to ask John here to open a flare um, in air, then we're going to pop him into the water for about 30 minutes, and after that 30 minute period, we'll ask him to do exactly the same thing again. I hasten to add, it's a dummy flare, so we won't have to take cover. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Well done, that's three seconds, very good. We're in re relatively warm water temperature, 14 degrees today. Early summer um, water temperature around the British Isles the kind of temperatures which people are swimming around in. OK, John, so how are you feeling? OK, cold. You're shivering up constantly now, are you? Yeah. So when you're ready? After 30 minutes, we repeated the flare test. Remember, John had taken just three seconds to fire it the first time. Go. He struggled to do the same thing after just 30 minutes in reasonably warm water. Now, once you reduce that temperature to five degrees, which is the average winter temperature, then that time extends. That's it. Well done. That was uh, 20 seconds. We've measured people taking two, two and a half minutes to try and do this type of activity in the colder water temperatures. And in some cases, of course, they'd fail altogether. People should be aware of these responses and the fact that very quickly you see a significant deterioration in your ability to do simple actions like open a flare, climb aboard a life raft, tie a knot uh, in a rope. And as a consequence of that, with that knowledge, you make sure you get those activities done very quickly before you lose the capability to do them. That's lovely. <laughs> Surviving for minutes or even hours is one thing, but I'm fascinated by people who've managed to go beyond that. People like Steve Callahan who survived for two and a half months after being shipwrecked. Steve had been sailing since the age of 12, intent on a life of adventure. In 1982, he stocked his boat here in the Canaries before enjoying a last beer and setting out across the Atlantic. Steve had sailed from America to England to compete in a race back across the Atlantic, but he'd been forced out of that by bad weather and had to make repairs in Spain. The Canaries were his last landfall before setting out to complete his journey. There you go, Jerry. Welcome aboard. Good to see you. I had uh, probably done about 40,000 miles or so of sailing. I'd been back and forth to Bermuda, I don't know, at least a half dozen times or so. I mean, I'd been across the Atlantic once and, and so on. So I was what I consider moderately experienced as a sailor.
Steve told his family and friends that his trip should take about a month, but that if conditions were against him, it could take much longer. Within a week, he was wishing he could have been more precise. The initial moments were um, a lot of things happening at once, a tremendous explosion um, and water came thundering in, like a, like a river flowing into the boat. I'm pretty sure it was something that T-boned the boat. Um, my presumption is it was a whale, but I'll never know for sure. The water was coming in very, very fast, and there was no question in my mind I had to get out of the boat. I knew that I really needed my ditch kit, so um, I took the chance of diving down and feeling around getting that. On board his raft, Steve had made some really good preparations. He had paddles with which he could obviously move it and ward off sharks. He had flares. He had a signal mirror, six pints of tinned water, some fishing kit, navigation equipment. That was going to prove vitally important. And he had a couple of these solar stills with which he could turn salt water into fresh drinking water. In his ditch kit, Steve had a few other useful emergency items. He kept a Tupperware box in which he had 21 more emergency flares. He had some emergency food. He had a knife, some pencils, two more pints of water. And most crucially of all, he had this, a spear gun. Although he was better prepared than many who found themselves in similar situations, Steve was initially pessimistic about his chances. I was just about smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there was certainly a big part of me that said, forget it, you're not even going to get out of here. I realized that in the area I was, I was in, I would be pushed by the currents and the trade winds towards the West Indies. Unfortunately, I figured it would take me about two and a half, three months in order to, to reach that land, and I didn't really think that I could live that long. But this book proved to be crucial. It's a manual to sea survival that contains just about everything you need to know to live from the sea. It was compiled by Dougal Robertson, who spent 38 days adrift with his family in 1972. Fortunately, Stephen included one of these in his ditch kit. It provided me both with um, concrete information and also a reminder of his own tale. Knowing that people somehow were able to create a life for themselves, um, even in the middle of this sort of uh, what, I, what I often call the watery uh, desert of the world, the ocean, um, gave me a great inspiration. The basic theory is that uh, you can live about 10 days without water and you can live a month without food. So uh, water is the definite priority. I had about eight pints of water in my ditch kit. So I figured, well, maybe I've got 18 days to live, which wasn't even enough time to get me to the shipping lanes, the nearest shipping lanes. I looked out in the ocean and it was it was beautiful. It was like a, you know a swimming pool, three miles deep, just gorgeous water. But it's the old uh, ancient mariner thing thing of you know water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. The reason you can't drink seawater is that if you do, the amount of salt in your body increases, which means you have to take water from your vital organs to dilute it. In other words, you dehydrate and die more quickly than if you drank no water at all. Dehydration is just a horrible, horrible thing. It was important to ration the water, and I, you know, I'm sitting there going, okay, in another half hour, I get to take this other little teeny bit of water in my mouth, and it's such a joy when you do, and then you wait for the another, another hour or two hours, so it, it just dominates your entire being. But there are a couple of pieces of modern equipment that can help you turn seawater into fresh water. This is a solar still. What we've got here is a ring section that helps it float and a condenser section, both of which need inflating. 
Through this tube here, you fill the central portion with seawater. Then under the action of the sun, that condenses as fresh water here, runs down on the inside of this part and is collected through this little tube here into that bag. This is another handy piece of equipment. It's called a reverse osmosis pump. And what this does is it removes the salt from the seawater. In here, I've got salt water and this tube Jerry's holding there, well, that's where the fresh water comes out of. And this is how it operates. And you can see though, that you don't get very much water, required a lot of pumping. So one tip is to do this pumping in the evening when you sweat less. Otherwise, you may use up more water than you get back from it. But these pumps hadn't been invented 20 years ago. All Steve had with him were solar stills, which were proving unreliable at first. The problem was that the waves would come by and take the solar still out to the end of its tether and snap it, which would fling the salt water into the, the fresh distillate, and I would end up with just salt water rather than fresh. Finding food wasn't a problem. There was no shortage of fish attracted by barnacles growing on the bottom of the raft. But catching them was a different matter. Despite having a spear gun, it took Steve nearly two weeks to break his duck. When I caught the first fish, I just broke down weeping from both uh, uh, horror and joy at the same time. I mean, it really was a, uh, an important psychological signal that I possibly could uh, live for two and a half, three months, whatever it took in order to reach land. At the same time, it was uh, also a signal that I'd been lowered to uh, the most desperate point in my entire existence. Later that same day, Steve managed to spear a Dorado, a fish that would provide his staple diet for the next nine weeks. The Dorado actually were an incredibly tasty fish to begin with. We pay good money for them in restaurants, and I wrote in my log that it was like being in this uh, dungeon, being thrown a filet mignon every, every few days. The interesting thing to me was that those parts of the fish that uh, normally I would think of as being incredibly disgusting were things that I actually looked forward to eating. They tasted the best to me. I mean, there was nothing better to me than a fresh fish eye, which, you know, young kids love to hear about, you know, eating fresh fish eyes because they think it just sounds so horrible. But for me, they were nuggets of, of almost pure fluid. And so that was a, a, a real kind of revelation that your body almost seems to know what it needs. Catching fish is never easy. It was 13 days before Steve caught any, and he had a spear gun. But even if you don't have a spear gun, there are some things you can do. One of the most obvious is to take a paddle like this and attach something sharp to the end of it to turn it into a spear. I lashed this knife on it earlier. And now, I've got a handy harpoon. Alternatively, you can use hooks and line. And if you haven't got fish hooks like these, you can improvise. Morris and Marilyn Bailey caught over 4,000 fish with hooks like that, made from safety pins. And finally, if you can get them, seabirds can be eaten. These are boobies, and they're very easily caught. If you put some bait on the deck with a noose around it, all you have to do is wait for the bird to come down, take the bait, and catch him by his legs. That's the origin of the word booby trap. After, I think after I was in the raft about two weeks or thereabouts, I really began looking at myself as a, kind of an aquatic caveman, someone who, uh, if I was inventive and lucky enough, could uh, live for an indefinite period of time out there. And once I entered that next stage, it, it was like, well, eventually I will make it out of here. Steve was being carried across the Atlantic by the North Equatorial Current and he knew from the charts in Dougal Robertson's book that he was south of this main transatlantic shipping route. So the best chance of being spotted wouldn't come till he was here, 
where ships passing from New York to the Cape crossed his route. But on the 14th night, he saw his first of several lone ships. Hey! It looked like it was coming to pick me up. So I kept firing up flares and swinging water and having a gay old time. But, um, the ship just kept steaming on, obviously hadn't seen me at all. I was very angry with myself because I'd counted on being rescued before the rescue was actually there. It was a good wake-up call for me, and I knew that I was probably making a lot of mistakes. And I made it a point to repeat to myself over and over again, you're only doing the best you can, that's all you can do. And that was important for me to kind of remind myself of that, forgive myself. Even after he'd established a routine, Steve could never relax. The dark shape of the raft made him a perfect target for sharks, and he often had to fend off unwanted attention with his spear gun. But there was one thing Steve feared more than shark attack, and that was damaging his raft. It was a risk he took every time he tried to catch food. On the 43rd day, I speared a fish, and the fish broke the spear, turned it around, and ran it into the bottom of the raft and ripped a fairly large hole in it. I knew I was in really big trouble then. This is how you repair a rip like that. You have to improvise some sort of bung to put in there. I've got a cork here. Of course, the gash Steve repaired was much larger than this, and he didn't have a cork. He had to improvise with bits of foam. Once you've got that in there, you need to gather the material around the bung and lash it in place with some fishing line or any sort of string that you can improvise. Got a bit of whipping twine here. When you think that I'm doing this in ideal circumstances, Steve, well, he was tired, wet, scared, and the gash was in a really awkward place. It didn't matter how tightly I tied that lashing. Whenever I inflated the bottom tube, it was it would try to stretch the mouth out again, and the plug that I had inside of it would just basically fall out. My feet were kind of going like this down, down into, the, into the water, and that meant that you know, it was incredibly uncomfortable, impossible to sleep, virtually impossible to fish in those conditions. And I was dragging this big bag of water with me, so the raft all of a sudden slowed to almost a dead stop in the water. I can't tell you exactly how freaked out and depressed I was. Steve faced 10 days of the same grueling routine. Plug the hole, pump up the raft, listen for bubbles, feel it deflate, and then start all over again. I wasn't eating properly, and I wasn't getting as much water as I was before, so it was an incredibly frustrating period, and, and one in which physically I deteriorated a lot. I realized that if I didn't find a solution, that I'd probably be dead in a matter of hours, and that kind of scared me back into reality. It finally dawned on me that if I put a pin through the upper lip and the bottom lip, that I could use that and as, as a fixed point, and that, that pin could not possibly fall out no matter how much pressure was put against it. And that gave me a point against which I could, I could make a lashing. This is basically how the repair looked. What Steve did was he pinned it with a broken shaft of a fork, and behind that, he lashed it securely to make it airtight. Well, with that in place, the raft was stable, and he could think about finding land. He was still in this area here, about 600 miles from the West Indies, but now pinpointing his exact position became critical. If this is the West, uh, with the United States sort of over here and the West Indies, and the West Indies kind of come up and then, then bend westward, and the, the Bahamas off of Florida, and England is over here, you have a general circulation of the North Atlantic of winds and currents that go kind of like this. So I was started off in the Canary Islands drifting towards the West Indies, but I was worried if I got above 18 degrees latitude 
that I would actually miss the West Indies, get caught up in the Gulf Stream, and end up at best in the Bahamas another month or so later, and at worst case, get caught up in the Gulf Stream in a strong way, and end up actually turning northward and eventually eastward, and end up over in England, which would have taken a year and something. And uh, I, I, I would never have even made—I would never have made the Bahamas. I don't think I would have made it over to England. So to find out exactly where he was, Steve first timed a piece of seaweed to see how long it took to reach the end of a piece of rope. That gave him his rough speed, and from that he could work out how far west he had drifted. Figuring out how far north or south you are is a bit more tricky, but it's quite good fun to try yourself. What you have to do is improvise a sort of a sextant, and this is how Steve did it. He took three pencils like this and connected them together into a triangle using elastic bands. The way we use this sextant is to measure the angle between the horizon and the north star at night. We do that by sighting along first this pencil and then this one, adjusting it as we need to. The angle that we get here corresponds to our latitude. I'll explain why. If I was standing on the Earth here at the North Pole, I'd find the pole star directly above me at 90 degrees. If I was standing on the equator, I'd find it just on the horizon at zero degrees. So whatever that angle that we read here, that will correspond to our latitude. In Steve's case, he was hovering on or about the line of 17 degrees north, which would bring him into the Leeward Islands somewhere around here. Two months after sinking, Steve had easily passed Dougal Robertson's 38 days, and what he'd achieved was remarkable. He'd organized food and water, overcome shark attacks and the leak in the raft, and was able to establish where he was, having covered 1,400 miles. But you're not a survivor until you've reached land and returned to full health. And in the 75th night, I finally started seeing the loom of a lighthouse, and as soon as I saw that, I had a had a whopping party, which for me was to drink a pint of water. I was so delighted. I mean, I can't, uh, yet I didn't want to believe that I was saved until I was actually on a beach on, you know, on solid ground. Steve was finally rescued by local fishermen the next morning. He'd lost a third of his body weight, but at least he was still alive. Steve's survival owes much to knowing what to do. His raft and emergency bag were well stocked, he did all the right things as the abandoned ship, and he was able to improvise whenever things started to go wrong. But he also had determination and a positive mental attitude. I came away with a feeling that you, you can't, you really can't control your destiny, but you can at least try to affect it. And if you're in an unpleasant situation, you can just do the best you can in order to affect a, a, a positive outcome. If that doesn't work, try it again. And if you're lucky enough, then you'll get through the situation. Next week, in the footsteps of Geronimo across the Arizona desert.